Good morning to uh, half the country and good afternoon to the other half. Uh, thanks for joining me today, Fish and Richardson's Insight Litigation Webinar Series. Uh, well, today we're going to discuss some Supreme Court decisions and how they might affect your day-to-day -day IP practice. As noted, I'm a principal at Fish, and for those of you who are interested, my biography should appear somewhere on the side of your screen. If uh, I welcome questions, you know, during uh, this session, I believe we have a Q&A button at the bottom where you can ask questions. But if you have any questions afterward, um, feel free to email me. My uh, email address is just my last name at fr.com. If you're joining Insights for the first time, this is. This monthly series uh, that we have explores cases and trends and provides perspectives about key legal developments and litigation strategies in intellectual property, commercial, and white-collar practice areas that, we're, that we have and that we're very proud of. Uh, we're excited to have you join us today, and we invite you to mark your calendars for the next seminar. I know we haven't even done this one, but mark it for October 15th, where we'll have trade secrets as a topic. Uh, the webinar there will feature my colleagues Natalie Arbaugh and Tommy Jacks, who are both principals at Fish in Austin and Dallas. So you're going to hear a Canadian accent today, and next month you'll hear an a, a accent from the country of Texas. If they're not a country yet, they might be by next month. Uh, they keep trying. So we'll hopefully you're able to join us next month also. Today's webinar will be an hour and include question and answer period at the end. You can ask questions at any time using the little Q&A button, as I mentioned, and we'll do our best to answer them at the end. I'll, if, if hopefully there's lots of questions. I'll stick around as long as there are questions and uh, as long as anybody else is willing to stick around. So uh, feel free to load them up. Um, also, feel, as I mentioned, feel free to contact me personally after the webinar if that's easier, if you have you know, some particular question. I'm, I'm happy to field anything, and I might give you a wrong answer. I might give you a right answer, and if it's right, it's free. So. Um, before we get started, I should remind you the content of this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of Fish and Richardson and is also not intended to address every court or case situation. I love those disclaimers. I actually read it. Um, I would like to see somebody try to somehow paint a firm with saying its opinion is the opinion of some guy who gave a CLE. If I was a judge, I'd probably throw them out of court, but we say it anyway. Uh, risk management, I guess. So let's get going. Um, I'll pull up here. We have our cover slide. I probably should have had the second slide open while I was reading all of that information. Um, so I'll let that sit for a little bit uh, while it's open. I just mentioned today, as I noted, we're doing a year in review. There's no real theme for these. It's, it's hard to come up with a theme for a year in review because you have to take the cases as the court took them. And the court can't say, well, you know, this year we're going to decide uh, statutory construction cases with a textualist approach or something like that. So it's a, a bit of a grab bag, but I'm going to try and, you know, hit, hit the high points um, and say something useful about each one of these cases and, and tie them up with a bow a little bit, at least for the important cases. What we're doing is going worst to first. Uh, I had to sort them in some order. And so not the worst decision, but the least relevant of the cases to the most relevant. Um, I'm not doing that to force you to stay to the end. It just seemed like it would be a good way to warm up and get going by just cruising through the first, uh, what, probably four cases here, three or four cases, and then wind up uh, with the ones that are important, and that way we can talk about them more if, they're, if time is available. And then I'll clean up with um, well, a typo in the last line, but issues that will always be a problem, issues that were ducked, and issue and, and things that are coming up. So that's kind of uh, what to look forward to here. And so uh, let's just get going. First issue, the, the worst, um, Medtronic versus Murawski. I have nothing against either Medtronic or Murawski. It's just that this uh, uh, case is probably not important to you. Um, the question is, what happens when a licensee wants confirmation that it doesn't infringe or that the patents that it, it's licensed under are invalid? If that happens and it files a DJ case, who has the burden to prove uh, infringement? Okay. And if you remember, MedImmune versus Genentech talked, it really opened up the ability of licensees to file DJ suits in these situations. And the whole thing of this case is that the patentee has the burden to prove infringement, just like it always does. Um, the court you know, cited policy and other things and basically said, all things being equal, it's best if we 
leave the burden on the patentee. Now, the, the licensee here had argued, well, that doesn't make any sense because, because the, or the licensor, I guess, the patentee, had argued that that makes no sense because it's not the one that's bringing the suit, number one. And number two, it doesn't really even have an ability to claim infringement because the, the licensee is licensed. So how should it, why should it have to prove infringement in a, in a license battle when it doesn't even have the ability to say that there is infringement? And the, and the Supreme Court said, well, you, know, you can still prove whether these, that these guys practice the limitations of the claim and thus need to pay the license. If you ever run into this, you'll have plenty of time to read the opinion and understand it deeper than anybody on this call. I doubt if you'll run into it too much because you'd have to have a situation where you have a patent license, and I'm sure all of you have some somewhere, um, number one. Number two, that it has to matter. You know, somebody wants to quit paying, and also where the burden of proof would actually make a difference. So um, I doubt that this is going to have much uh, impact going forward. People now know the answer, and unless you're a law professor who uh, teaches civil procedure, it probably isn't much interest to you. Okay, second case. You say, uh, why is this the second worst case? This is a very important issue, limelight versus Akamai. And the answer is because the Supreme Court ducked it. Um, I probably should move it up in importance because it will be important again soon, in a few months. Um, so what is it about? If this is the joint infringement or split infringement case, right? So you have a method claim and one party uh, performs some of the steps and causes another party to perform the rest of the steps. And can you, get, as the patentee, get damage for infringement there? Or you have a situation where one party causes two other parties to perform the steps of the claim. So it's situations where you don't have a single party performing all the steps. And the question is, what situations, if any, uh, that, uh, create infringement in that area? Now, you've got to go back a little bit to understand Limelight and Akamai because the Federal Circuit had held in BMC and Muni Auction. I think they were in that order, all right, that, it, that direct infringement requires a single actor, okay? Then it held in Akamai that a party can induce even if two parties perform the steps of the claim. In, in other words, you can have inducement without literal, okay? And that's what went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said that's crazy. It doesn't make any sense. We're going to reverse, okay? So you can't have inducement without literal, but what the Supreme Court said was we, we're not being asked whether the decision in BMC and Muni action, Muni auction, sorry, are right or not. That, that's not before us, okay? And so what we have now is the, the parties are back in front of the federal circuit. They argued in front of, oh gosh, Judge Prost, I know, Judge Moore, and I forget who the third one was, uh, on September 11th, so you know, just last week, and it's a pretty good argument. I, I recommend that you listen to it. Go to the Federal Circuit website. You can pull it up easily. Um, it was Seth Waxman is representing, what would it be, the patentee, I guess, and I'm not sure who's on the other side, and they were arguing about what the test should be. Um, now, this is where it gets important for some of you because you got two routes here. One is to try to get around BMC and Muni Auction, and that's the only route available to the panel because that it's binding authority of the Federal Circuit on this panel. So they can potentially get around BMC and Muni Auction by saying those are, are cases that held that for there to be literal infringement, well, let me just, that, that BMC and Muni Auction only held that there is direct infringement when one party directs or controls the actions of another, an agency situation or something close to that, okay? And to argue that those two cases did not hold that there is direct infringement only when one party directs or controls another, okay? Those cases gave an example of when there is direct infringement, but not an exclusive example. And you can actually read the language of those cases to get there, and there was a lot of discussion at the oral argument about that. Um, you know, if you listen to it, you'll hear uh, uh, Judge Moore and, and Mr. Waxman talking about getting in a boat together and sailing across the ocean or across a lake with that theory, but whether they were going to drown when doing that. Um, but there's, there's some concern that if you read the Supreme Court opinion, 
the Supreme Court did not read BMC and Muni Auction as having such a narrow holding, and that the court actually in BMC and Muni Auction never intended them, their opinion to have that narrow of a holding. So there's a big question whether the panel will just try to get around BMC and Muni Auction if they want to expand what can be an infringement. So that's number one. Um, number two is, well, if we take BMC and Muni Auction away, um, what should we have as the test? Okay. In other words, the court would have to go and bank for that. And procedurally, it's kind of interesting. It's like, what, what are, what's going to happen? And we've had some discussions in this office of how they could do that, right? One thing they could do is the panel could just decide that BMC and Muni Auction are a problem, tell the rest of the court, write an opinion that assumes that BMC and Muni Auction are wiped out, see if the rest of the court likes that opinion, and then they could just append a footnote to the opinion that says the, the court went in bank and vacated B, BMC and Muni Auction and then sent this thing back to the panel to write this opinion, you know, the attached opinion. That would be one approach. The other thing they could do is just punt and uh, issue an, an in-bank order and have argument all over again to the in-bank court and so on. It's, you know, I don't have an opinion on which one they would take. If I was them, I'd take the, the lighter version because you can make sure that the panel writes the opinion that the in-bank court agrees with, but it doesn't quite have the same imprimatur of the in-bank court, and so it might leave you a little more wiggle room to adjust the test down the road. Um, so, you know, procedurally, that's that. So let's look at the substance, though, of what, what could, could happen here because I think this is the the part that could be important to a number of you. Um, Waxman is up there arguing that the test should be that for a joint tortfeasor, okay? And under his reading of Prosser and the law of torts, that simply requires knowledge of the activity that's occurring, okay? So you could be a, I guess, uh, a direct infringer if you just knew that your customers were performing the steps that happened to infringe and nothing more, all right? That sounds bad enough, but let me give you something that's even worse. What if you build a platform? And a lot of our clients build platforms, software or hardware platforms. You build chips that people then program in certain ways, or you build software that people program in certain ways. Could you have a situation where the claim has, makes some passing generic reference to the microprocessor, most claims do talk about processors, or to the operating system or some other part, part of a platform, a cloud platform, right? You have a virtualized cloud offering that you give to people and then your customers, you know, customize it. Well, what if one element of the claim just talked about the platform? It's kind of an unnecessary throwaway limitation, but it did nonetheless. You could have a very serious problem under the test that that uh, uh, Mr. Waxman is proposing, joint and several, um, joint tort fees or liability, right? And I used to be on a, a, a committee for amicus briefs, and we had some attorneys that were proposing this, and, and certain of us thought they were nuts, and said, well, what, what about the, the people that build the platform and don't, you know, don't care and have no control over what their customers do, but presumably know what they're doing, or maybe they got a cease and desist letter from the patent owner saying, hey, we know that your customers are programming your platform in the following way. Um, you know, what do they do? And, and the answer was, well, they can get, they can get uh, contribution from the customers, right? And if you build a platform, you're probably sitting there going, oh, so I'm the deep pocket, and then I have to go sue my, my customers to go get contribution for the stuff that they did to my generic platform. Right. So I think there's, personally, this is not the position of fish again. I'll go back and maybe we do need that disclaimer at the beginning. My view is that joint tort fees or liability with a very low knowledge requirement um, could be a real problem. Now, in the oral argument, Judge Moore pushed back against Mr. Waxman and said, well, listen, if you read Prosser, the knowledge requirement isn't just that, that the people are doing the thing, but that damage is occurring, okay? There's a link in all the tort law about damage occurring, and therefore this, you know, my hypothetical platform developer um, would not be liable unless they actually had some knowledge of infringement. They don't know anything that there's damage, you know, the acts of their customers aren't damaging anyone until they know that there's an infringement. Um, 
So then there may be some question of, well, you know, that's a higher standard, and that's probably, in my view, a lot closer to where we ought to be here, um, that there needs to be some sort of higher knowledge or intent or something. Now, where that leads us to is, is people kind of get their, their shorts all in a bunch about 271A, B, and C, right? 271A is direct infringement, 271B is induced, and 271C is, is contributory infringement. And they say, well, this doesn't fit in to X, Y, or Z because of the following reasons. My answer to that, I think, is two, the, the, the three sections were created in 52, I believe, in some act around 52. It probably was the 52 Act. And when Congress did that, they said, listen, we are not changing the common law of patent infringement. I don't know why they split it up, maybe just for you know, easier analytical capability or what have you. So in my view, what the court needs to do is say, well, what is, what is or should be the common law of patent infringement? And then we'll figure out how to fit it into A, B, or C, or not fit it in, or what have you. Um, but we should not let the kind of artificial lines that might be drawn between those three sections drive the, the substantive result. Really, the substantive result should be what is right as a you know common law view, which is, you know, public policy, what makes sense, that's what the common law is, right? You know, that's how we got things like uh, approximate cause and other things in, in tort law, right? Because we said, you know, courts, I don't know who it was, uh, I guess it's uh, the, the scale fell at the train station, right? And we have to cut off liability at some point, and we came up with proximate cause. Same thing, I think, ought to be done here as we figure out, okay, what makes sense where liability should be cut off for these so-called joint actors and we come up with the, the common law holding for it, and then we try to fit it into 271A, B, or C because Congress told us that that's what they wanted to have happen when they split it up. But we'll see what the, the court ends up doing. It seemed like uh, Judges Moore and, and, and uh, the Chief Judge were all over that, Chief Judge Prost, in the oral argument. Um, Chief Judge Prost brought up the point about how you know, not so much this fairness for a platform developer, but how you could basically end run inducement by drafting your claims the right way, right? Normally you would have to prove inducement by this platform developer. And if you just added their platform into your claim, now all of a sudden you have strict liability and you don't have to prove the inducement. And that seemed like, a, like an end around. You know, my answer to that is, well, the test probably ought to be commensurate with in what our standards are for inducement, right? A, a third party should be liable for taking part in a multi-party infringement if they had all the things that are relevant for inducement or something in that area. The problem is that causes people's heads to explode because they consider this to be a, 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 a strict liability offense, and now all of a sudden you're putting some inducement stuff into what they consider to be strict liability. And you know, I, I get that that it is a problem, um, but I'm just hopefully framing the issues somewhat for you so you can appreciate what it is and some of you should appreciate why it's important for you. Um, so the case has been pretty quiet, but you know, if the Federal Circuit doesn't get it right in in and right meaning what my view of right is, um, some of you may all of a sudden be paying attention, so you may want to pay attention before that day. So that's Limelight versus Akamai, an interesting joint infringement. You know, a lot of you are, are avoiding this by drafting your claims for one infringer. Uh, system claims don't have as much a problem or any problem because NTP versus RIM and what uh, Centillion probably I think is the is the more direct on point case suggests that uh, a system claim is infringed by the person who gets beneficial use of the system, and so that gets around a problem uh, where the system is you know carried out by two parties. You know, nonetheless, their customer who uses the system will be the direct infringer. So you can get infringement there. You're going to have to prove inducement, um, which is not the easiest thing in the world. Um, but uh, you at least have an ability to get infringement. So, you know, it's important to draft your claims for one infringer for a lot of reasons. It's important to avoid having to try and prove even inducement or contributory infringement for a lot of reasons. If you're a prosecutor, you can talk to your litigators and find out what a pain that is. Um, I've seen cases where, you know, it's, it's clear the jury split the baby. They said, you know what, this defendant is infringing. You know, they're meeting all the limitations, but I really like the CEO, and he looked like a good witness. 
So I'm going to just find that there's direct infringement but not find inducement. Um, and so if you're a prosecutor, you need to write your claim so you're not in that situation where you're suing a, a, a choir boy CEO um, who's going to get out of liability at least for pretrial infringement uh, because the, the, you've know, because you forced your litigators to bring an indirect infringement case instead of direct. All right. Copyright on TV. This one's not that important to most of you, but it could be for some of you. It's, it was, it's a big case, but it's kind of a, a sui generis case now. The, the courts decided it. There's some stuff to clean up. And, uh, you know, a disclaimer, we represented Aereo for the last, uh, for a long time, basically helped put together uh, their strategy representing the district court, the appellate court, and up to the Supreme Court. Um, so what is this? Because some of you may have heard of it but don't really know exactly what it is. So I'll go into the facts a little bit more because the facts really do matter. It did matter to the, to the Supreme Court. What Aereo does, and it's shown in, in the photo in the background, Aereo builds data centers inside the broadcast area of major cities. So New York City, they set up a data center. I don't know, it was like across the river from whatever tower in Manhattan has all the TV antennas in it. And they put in these computer server systems that have hundreds and probably thousands of little antennas on them. And so the picture you see are TV antennas on mounted to printed circuit boards and jam-packed into a bunch of computer servers, right? Every card has, I don't know, a couple hundred antennas, something like that. And every antenna is dedicated to one and only one customer. There's not one big antenna that serves a bunch of other, a bunch of customers, you know, just split it up. It's a one-to-one -one thing, all right? So by analogy, what Aereo is creating is a really long antenna wire from your computer to Aereo's data center antenna, all right? Aereo also has DVR capabilities, so they have hard drives that you can store stuff to. But generally, that wasn't relevant to the result. What they're doing is, is giving people who don't want to have cable TV and don't want to stick an antenna on their house or apartment they're giving them the equivalent of having broadcast television, okay? They're not stealing any cable signals. They're not doing, this is all stuff that their customers could have gotten free anyway. Also, they'll only give you the programming that's in your local area. They will not, you know, you can't, if you live in Minneapolis, you can't sign up for Aereo in Boston. Um, it's not that. And so what, you know, they're, reason for doing that is to say, listen, all we're doing is giving the people what they could have gotten for free by having a physical antenna. We're providing this kind of rented antenna plus a virtual link through the internet to their computer so they can watch TV. All right. That goes up to the Supreme Court. The question was, what does it mean to publicly perform? Aereo says, we're not performing anything because the, the user pushes all the buttons and picks what they want to watch and all of that stuff. And so we're not, you know, we're just a passive, uh, we're, we're similar to this old cable visions uh, case that came out of the Second Circuit. But the Supreme Court said, you know what, you, you're being hyper-technical with all your super long antennas and virtual physical connections and all this. We think you look like these people in the 60s who would stick a big antenna up on a hill, you know, peop, uh, a community lived down in a valley and couldn't get, un get television, so these people would put a big hit antenna up on the hill, let's say, you know, east of San Jose, and then run a, a wire down and, and, and break the wire up and send uh, the signal from that big antenna down to everybody down in the valley. You know? And they had argued back in the 60s and 70s that that's okay because we're just providing a longer antenna. And Congress had reacted by passing the 76 Act and saying, no, you can't do that. Okay? And to... to the Supreme Court, the fact that Aereo gave everybody their own antenna instead of having one big antenna that split things up, the Supreme Court felt that that was just a hyper-technical lawyer's workaround that made no, no substantive difference, okay, and, and held that Aereo can't do what it's doing. The thing is, in the process, the Supreme Court essentially said that those antenna on a hill companies were, were like cable companies today. And so after the Supreme Court decision, Aereo said, okay, fine, we're a cable company. Um, and I think, uh, I don't know as well as others how that works, but I think cable companies are required to pay license fees to the broadcast companies, you know, ABC, CBS, NBC. But they're also 
automatically given the signals, right? They, they, they get a compulsory license to carry the signal. The, the networks can't stop them. And so that's what Aereo has been arguing in, on remand uh, that it gets. I think the result is that it lost at the district court. And maybe I don't know where it is exactly. I should tell you, if you have it, or why might this be relevant to you? Aereo, in a lot of ways, looks like Dropbox. And you know, I'm not beating up on Dropbox. So, and, and a lot of people have services like Dropbox. In fact, there was one in New Zealand, uh, Kim.com, I can't remember what he called it. And our government went over and shut the thing down, OK? And so what's the difference between Dropbox, which we, you know, we all know and love, and, and other companies who provide you know, the ability to share files online in a nice, secure way? What's the difference between that and Kim.com, who, who a lot of people thought was a criminal? There's you know, very subtle differences. There's a huge difference in the result. But you know, the technologies are somewhat similar. And so the technology of Aereo, of capturing copyrighted content for a user, storing it either for a fraction of a second or for a long time on a hard drive, and then providing it to that customer, you could say is somewhat similar to allowing a customer to upload copyright stuff into a cloud and then get it back later. And so if you have services like that, you I don't know how concerned you are, but you should uh, understand that, you know, if you're in the copyright area for these companies, you should understand this. Um, and so, you know, I can't go much deeper into it here, both because of time and my knowledge. I can tell you that the, the guys for FISH who represented Aereo and are, you know, more than, I know have talked to some of you and are more than happy to talk to you for free, um, are Mark Puzella, P-U-Z-E-L-L-A, and David Hosp, H-O-S-P, they're on the website. You can send me a note if, if you want a presentation on this area. Um, they, they'd be more than happy to you know, do a webinar, do something by phone, come out and meet with you, um, and so on. OK, enough shameless self-promotion. Um, next case, Petrella versus MGM, another copyright case. Now, some of you are like, wait a minute, I'm a patent attorney. Why do you keep talking about these copyright cases? Don't worry, the, the last one was a copyright case. This one is a patent case, or it's in this presentation as a patent case. All right, so let me give the facts real quick. Petrella, her dad wrote Raging Bull, okay, or wrote the screenplay for Raging Bull. And Raging Bull's old as the hills, almost as old as my legal career. Um, and so she waited 18 years to sue MGM. I forget what she thought was the problem with, you know, she must have been paid something for the screenplay, but apparently not as much as she thought, right? And so, and I assume her, the, 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 Screenplay writer is deceased, I would guess. So she sought, sought only three years' worth of damages because that's the statutory copyright damages limit. Okay. Um, MGM said, you can't get anything. You waited 18 years. Uh, uh, latches blocks all of your pre-suit damages, at least. right? So you can't get those three years. Maybe you can get something moving forward. I don't know what their argument was there. But you, can't, you, you don't even get the last three years of, of Raging Bull DVD sales. District Court in the Ninth Circuit found for uh, MGM and, and found that latches applied, and the Supreme Court reversed. Okay, Supreme Court said there's really no basis for latches in the copyright doctrine. We have a there's a nice three-year damages limit, so Congress has you know expressed its view on what it thinks should be the limit for damages. Um, there's not you know overriding policy reasons why you have to have you know why why that three-year limit isn't enough and that for some reason in equity we have to impose on top of that a latches limitation. Um, and, and so they, they ruled for uh, Petrella there and she was able to get three extra years of damages. Importantly, they said, listen, there are situations, kind of a, you know, estoppel-like situations where latches or estoppel or something might apply. And the, you know, some of the examples are, um, I think they gave an example of an architect has some plans, somebody builds an apartment building, copying those plans. Um, um, e e e how was that? That latches would apply because, uh, I forget, that because of the building and the excess damages that accrued, it would be unfair even within e e e the, the three-year period to give uh, 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 royalties or, or damages uh, to the architect in that situation. But it was more of... You know, I would call it aggravated copyright infringement, right? That's the, or, or aggravated latches, I guess. There, there has to be some aggravating factor for latches or estoppel or what have you to uh, apply. Um, and that's the extraordinary circumstances of point number one on this slide. 
Now, why does it matter to all you patent people? I'm sure some of you are copyright people, but I'm going to guess the, the vast majority are patent people. Um, the reason it matters to you is there's not a whole lot of difference between copyright latches and patent latches, right? There's a six-year damage on or limitation on damages in patent law, not a three-year. There's there are better policy reasons for why latches should apply in patent law. For example, I would expect you know some of the investment um, um, damage to a company is bigger when you're building plants to build um, uh, you know physical stuff. You know you build a whole entire factory system to build your medical device in reliance on on, on the latches and delay of the patentee. Um, that's a whole lot more than you know, the cost of printing, you know, even 10,000 copies of Raging Bull or something like that, or, or printing up a bunch of DVDs or what have you. Um, you. You know, you can see where some of that is bigger in the patent realm. I would think that some of the evidentiary prejudice is worse in the patent area, right? Uh, prior art uh, is very important in patent law, so if somebody waits 14 years to sue you on their patent, uh, you would have been in a lot better shape for finding prior art if they'd sued you on day one. But of course, that's going away too with, you know, we have search engines uh, available to us to find prior art in much better ways than we used to. And there, you know, and there are kind of prior art issues in copyright. You know, did the, did the guy who, who made Raging Bull copy it from someone else and those types of things, or is it actually an original work? So, you know, the patent stuff isn't that much different than, than copyright there. But nonetheless, there is a footnote, and I forget, or not a footnote, it's, I think it's in the body of the text. They said, listen, no, it is in, a, in the middle of a footnote. Um, somebody asked, you know, please talk about patent law in one of the amicus briefs, and the Supreme Court just said, listen, we have no, uh, no reason to go there. Um, they're, they're, um, we don't need to talk about patent law. We understand, they said, that the Federal Circuit has found that latches do apply in patent law. Uh, because of some language in Section 282, um, because of legislative history of the Patent Act, and because of kind of just pract long practice in the patent area, where the last one seems much weaker to me. Um, but they said, we're not going to decide that one today. Um, the, the Section 282 part, I think, is 282 talks about defenses in, in, a, in a patent case, one of them being an absence of liability for infringement. And I believe the, the, you know, the, the position is that's a, a nod by the by Congress to latches. Um, I forget what there were two other uh, things in 282 for when you're not liable. One is uh, unenforceability, um, and the first one is something else. So, you know, it's, it's basically the argument is 282 is is Congress's nod to these judicially made uh, non-liability situations for patents, and copyright doesn't have those that. Section 282 or an analog to it, and therefore patents are different than, than copyright. Key thing for you to know is this is out there. If you have a case where you're pleading latches or somebody's pleading latches against you, um, make sure to propose a jury instruction or, or you know, oppose the entire defense or whatever. Preserve your right to appeal. Right now it is the law in the federal circuit, and so you will lose with a district court unless you're the best lawyer in the land and can convince a uh, a, a district court to ignore binding precedent that clearly was not overruled in Petrella because the Supreme Court said we're not going to talk about it. And if you can do that, good for you. But otherwise, you make sure when you get to trial that you object to uh, any latches instruction or you know if, if the latches is going to the court that you object to that and keep the, the issue alive. And then when you get up to the federal circuit, maybe uh, before you even file a brief, you move for a bank uh, reconsideration of uh, uh, I don't know if it would be Ackerman uh, is probably the case that you'd ask to have reconsidered, but um, you know, keep it in front of you and make sure you know what's going on. All right, now we're in the, the, the cases that are starting to get more interesting, Nautilus versus Biosig. Um, this is a case about one, Section 112 and indefiniteness. Um, Federal Circuit, as we all know, hasn't made a claim indefinite, at least on you know, straight-up indefiniteness forever. Um, the Exxon versus United States case and, and some of the others um, show how hard it is. You know, the court has said, listen, just because it's hard to construe a claim doesn't mean the claim is indefinite. Um, all, all terms are hard, but indefinite only comes up. And here's the, the test that kind of drew the ire. If the term is, quote, not amenable to construction, 
So I guess that means not amenable at all. And uh, here's another typo. Or insolubly ambiguous. That was the phrase that people latched on to and, and, and had problems with. Okay. Uh, goes up to Supreme Court. Um, Supreme Court says, indef gosh darn, I can't type. Or indefinite. If the claims fail to inform with reasonable certainty those skilled in the art about the scope of the invention. All right. So it's reasonable certainty, I guess, is, is the test instead of insolubly ambiguous. All right. So yeah, okay, insolubly in ambiguous, not amenable are kind of pushed up to the wall standards, right? You've got to go all the way to the end. There's no, no gray area with those, whereas reasonable certainty sounds definitely like a gray area standard that, uh, you know, you could invalidate a, a patent somewhere out in the playing field somewhere, whereas the Federal Circuit uh, standard, you had to basically push it all the way to the edge. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot more there. You know, the Supreme Court... It's funny, you read the opinion and they felt like they were saying something new when they said um, that it had to be read in light of the specification and prosecution history, you know, as a person of ordinary skill in the art would read it. Um, when, you, when you read their opinion, it sounds like they discovered that that idea when, you know, I don't know, it's been repeated, what, 45,000 times by the Federal Circuit in the last decade. Um, you know, certainly the Federal Circuit has never wavered from its view and, and has has probably overemphasized its view that everything, enablement, indefiniteness, claim construction, whatever, are read according to the way a, a posita would read them. Um, so I, I, it's, it's kind of funny that the Supreme Court emphasized that point so much because they seem to think that perhaps the Federal Circuit wasn't doing that and was allowing judges to, to determine what they would think that the meaning of the term was. Um, you know, it's now back. Parties briefed it to the Federal Circuit, as I understand, and they're going to argue, you know, whether it applies in their particular case. That might have an effect. What I take this case is, I call it a nudge case. I think it's like KSR, right? In KSR, it wasn't so much um, what the court said or what they did with the KSR patent, but the fact that they sent a pretty clear message that in KSR that they wanted more 103 in validity that they knew that the Federal Circuit really wasn't killing any patents under 103 and they wanted that to happen more. I think it's something similar here, right? They know that the Federal Circuit's really not killing any patents for indefiniteness and they'd like more of that. Now, um, there's just a report today by a, a, a lawyer at another firm, and I'm sorry, I, I should have written down who it was and cited him. So I won't steal his copyright, but I'll steal a little bit of his data. Um, technically is okay, I guess. Um, they, they found 39 cases in the last 90 days that cite to Nautilus. 27 of those found all of the terms definite, and three killed all or, or found all of the, the terms to be indefinite. See, I mean, you take from that, you're like, well, okay, three really succeeded. Um, I guess nine might have been successes, maybe complete successes, and 27 were complete failures. If you're if you're a defendant, you'd say, well. I don't know, it's only the cost of doing the motion. If I got a 25% chance of getting out of this lawsuit, maybe it's worth writing this motion. Um, you know, so maybe my view of it isn't as pessimistic as the people that wrote that article that said that the you know, likelihood of success is low. Um, but, you know, this is not something where you're going to see a sea change, I don't think, in, in how this, uh, how this uh, area is treated. Um, whereas in KSR, you saw quite a sea change. Um, I think that's it for that guy. Let's, uh, we're almost to Alice. Let's go to our next slide, though. Oh, multiple ways to be indefinite. Just keep in mind that Nautilus really only dealt with this situation where you had terms that, you know, maybe skilled artisans disagreed on their meaning or something like that, some ambiguity. But there's other ways to be indefinite. I swear I've missed a couple, but here, here are some examples, right? A claim recites a numeric value, and the patent doesn't tell you how to measure that. Um, I think there's, is it um, a Honeywell case maybe or, or somebody that has that as, a, as its main point, and that's kind of the seminal case. There's a similar area where you say about or approximately or, or near or you have some other term of degree, and then the patent doesn't tell you kind of how to measure that term of degree. That's another way to be indefinite. I don't consider those to be Nautilus-like cases. They may be affected by the change in the standard in Nautilus, you know, because it loosens up a little bit but I see them to be, you know, kind of a different approach to indefiniteness. 
And then you have the subjective uh, terms like visually pleasing. There was that case from, gosh, that's probably seven years old now. Um, and then there was another one probably in the last couple of weeks um, having to do with a, was it matching the visual display or the visual impression of screens? I think the invention was to create some screen that matched another screen visually. And uh, it had a subjective language in it like pleasing and the Federal Circuit uh, invalidated it uh, using uh, the, you know, the seven-year-old case. So that comes up some. And then there's the 112.6 with no corresponding structure. I don't really can, I don't know that that's indefiniteness, right? It's just, um, it's too broad. And, and, you know, the Supreme Court in Halliburton said it, it, it doesn't tie to what you invented. It's just, you know, it goes on forever uh, when you try to do a means without limiting it to a particular structure. You know, that's kind of offensive to public policy. And in Halliburton, they killed the claim. And then 112.6, they tried to create a little uh, procedural way to, to not put the structure in your claim, but have it in your spec. Um, and, you know, if you don't have it in your spec, then you're invalid under Halliburton and, and so on and other Federal Circuit case law. But that's really totally different than what's going on in Nautilus. Um, so really, I don't think Nautilus uh, affects, you know, all the various, what is it, Blackboard software and WMS gaming and all those other 112.6 cases. Um, I don't think uh, Nautilus has anything to do with those. All right. The oh yeah, we got one more before um, before we talk about section 101. Octane Fitness and Highmark. One of them is burden of pr or um, standard of review for a um, for a uh, uh, um, B award. Uh, these guys were the the petitioners were unhappy. They'd been sued by non-practicing entities. Uh, uh, that, that's not what the petitioners called them. They used a, a shorter word to describe what these plaintiffs were, and they told the Supreme Court that we have a plague of, of baseless litigation, and they got uh, cert granted. And um, two cases, one was what's the standard of review, how much deference does the district court get, and then the other one is, well, what what is the standard that we use? Okay. And so high mark is the standard of review. That was a win for defendants. I mean, I guess fees could be awarded against plaintiffs too, right? But um, but really what they're shooting for here are plaintiffs who don't do a decent pre-suit investigation, make kind of slapdash assertions of infringement and so on. Um, and so really these decisions were pro-defendant, but I'm sure they can be used to help a plaintiff, you know, where a defendant's, well, we'll talk about willfulness here in a second. Um, so in Highmark, they said that, that the Federal Circuit has to uh, give uh, dis, uh, abusive discretion review to the district courts. Um, so that alone probably would have changed some things because it might have um, emboldened district courts to say, you know what, I'm not just going to get slapped down. I'm going to take a shot. I don't like the plaintiff in that this case. I'm going to enter fees against him, and I'm not going to have to worry so badly that, that the Federal Circuit's going to hurt my affirmance uh, rate. Um, so that's the, you know, the procedural case, and it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, octane fitness is the substantive case, and the, the Federal Circuit had, had required this brought in subject to bad faith and objectively baseless requirement, and requiring clear and convincing evidence of those. Really exciting to PRE on, on antitrust and some of its other case law. And the Supreme Court said, no, you, you don't understand PRE. This, this, it doesn't plug in the way you thought. It's not, it doesn't have to be, have these two requirements. It just has to, to be uh, what, uh, one that stands out from others or is uh, pursued in an unreasonable manner, right? So again, you know, this is a little bit like the last case where the Federal Circuit kind of had this standard that was much closer to the wall or the end zone or whatever analogy you want to use. And the Supreme Court said, no, 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 we're going to put the line more in the middle so that it's easier to cross that line, okay? Um, they also lowered it from from clear and convincing the preponderance of the evidence standard. I'm not sure if, how much that ends up changing. You know, if a judge thinks your case is horrible, I don't know if, if the, the burden is going to change his or her mind. Um, you know, so what, what does this mean? Um, so far, I haven't, I haven't done a study of the cases after this, but I have seen a, a handful where fees were not awarded. I believe one in which Judge Dyke from the Federal Circuit was acting as a, a district judge and a num another where uh, uh, Judge uh, uh, Bryson was acting as the trial judge. Um, and so, you know, it's not like it's going to lead to some flood, but I think you should expect to see fees awarded more often against patentees. 
Um, hopefully you, if you're a patentee, are doing halfway decent pre-suit uh, investigations, and so you don't have to worry about this. Um, you, you know, if you go out there, you can see some really frightening assertions of patents where you have to believe that the person didn't spend more than 15 minutes um, thinking about their case before they filed it. And hopefully this, these holdings are directed to those situations. Um, you know, I think a, a lot of it's going to be in the non-practicing entity space because those of you, I know there's a lot of large companies on this call um, and the work that I do with, with not all of you, the, the work that I do with large companies, we spend time on pre-suits. The, you know, you get business buy-off, multiple eyes look at these things. There is, there is concern about public perception of asserting patents. There is concern about all of that. It's not slapdash. And so I, you know, it, this probably will be more prevalent in the non-practicing entity area just because of that. I'm not saying MPEs don't do the same thing, but I'm saying that across the board with, you know, large Fortune 500 clients, We've done serious pre-suits and not screwed things up. Um, so then the one other issue that you should know for this is willfulness. If you look, this subjective bad faith, objectively baseless thing looks a little bit like the Federal Circuit standard, like a little bit, a lot, a bit, like the Federal Circuit standard for willful infringement. Um, I believe in the last two months, this topic has come up in three different cases where willfulness is an issue. Um, Judge Hughes, I think, has been on at least a couple of them um, and has felt that Octane doesn't really change the law of willfulness that much, if I have the right person here. But it's coming. You know, the, It's going to be resolved one way or the other very soon, like in the next month or two. And so um, I encourage you to be up on that. If you have willfulness in your case, be ready for the law to change if it's going to change. Don't assume the law stays the same. Make sure to you know raise an objection during a... a, a jury instructions, and so on. All right. We're probably on pretty good time here. There's a few slides left, but some of them are more for you just to have and to hold and hold dearly for yourselves and not for me to talk about. So let's talk about Section 101, Alice Corp versus CLS Bank for a little bit. Um, you know, I sat around before this thing. I thought that, that, that uh, you know, lightning would come and give me great insight and that I'd give you all the simple one-sentence answer for what the heck does this case mean and what do we do with it? There is no simple answer, both because, well, he, he, you know, everybody can have their own view. Some people might have the view that there's no simple answer because the, the Supreme Court's all screwed up. Some people might have the answer because the Patent Office is all screwed up. Some people might say district courts are all screwed up. Or some people might say everybody's got it right because so far they're killing all the patents. Um, but this is complex and, there, you, you know, it's not like, you know, there's three words that you can add to your claims to make them valid or that there's some automatic thing to know when you should move for summary judgment of invalidity. It's complex. Um, it, there are many, as many fact patterns as there are claims in the world, right? All right, so let's just hit some background real quick. The biggest background, the statute, Section 101, broad as heck. The language of Section 101 allows the claims of Alice, I forget, Alice the plaintiff, or the, anyway, they were the petitioner, um, yeah, the Federal Circuit killed the claim, so Alice would have been the patentee also. Um, so under the statute, clearly these claims qualify because they were a mess, or what is it, process is the language in 101. But the statute is not the only thing at play here. There are public policy-based exceptions. Um, you know, you may not like them, but we've had them for 100 years, and so they're there. Um, and so you got to play that game, and the Supreme Court is not ready to overturn those exceptions and apply a textualist reading to the statute. So they're there. Um, and, you know, what I try to, to summarize them here is that these exceptions say that you should not be able to take away core tools from the public. I put the word core in quotes just because it was important to me. I, don't, I doubt if it's appeared in any Supreme Court case, so the, the quotes there might be a little distracting. Um, but the idea is there's certain things that we just need to carry out our work, whether it's uh, laws of nature um, whether it's abstract ideas and, and we need to be able to work around that. It's just offensive to public policy, according to the Supreme Court, to allow those things to be locked up by one person for 17 or 20 years. Um, the old case law, O'Reilly versus Morris, you remember you couldn't cover all ways of moving information at a distance. But then there were narrower claims that talked about, you know, how a, you know, the, the more technical aspects of how um, 
you know, how a, a, a Morse code, how a, a telegraph would work, and those were validated. So we had that. You know, they didn't say Section 101 because we didn't have Section 101 at the time, um, but it's been read as a 101 case. Diamond versus Chakrabarty, anything under the sun made by man. People love that quote. It's dicta. It, it was quoted from something that was stated by a single individual in the legislative history, I believe, which, you know, Scalia would tell you isn't even worth, you know, the time of day. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's inevitable that, you know, pe that that's a cute quote, but it didn't end up being a holding, right? Um, but then we get to um, Parker versus Fluke, Gottschalk versus Benson, and Diamond versus Deer, all nominally software cases. I don't know, you know, maybe they were done on circuits or whatever, but they all had to do with automation of some sort, computer stuff of some sort, processing by electronic means. So essentially software, whether they were implemented as hardware, firmware, software, fine. But under the, the general field of software as we know it today. And two of them found claims invalid. One of them found them valid. Deere was the valid. Fluke and Benson were invalid. And I, I suggest that the difference is that Deere actually did something with the processing, whereas Fluke and Benson were just mere processing. Fluke was updating an alarm limit basic processing, you know, maybe they you know, change some value in a storage location, but that's it. Benson, uh, converting binary, the BCD binary, some decimal conversion anyway. Um, and, and, you know, that was just processing, you know, making, doing math on a computer basically, right? Whereas Deere, there was an algorithm, it was the Arrhenius equation, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. But then they did something with it. They used the Arrhenius equation to compute when, um, when you should open up a mold in, a, in an injection molding system, right? Um, and so the, the court said, well, here, you know, they, they're not trying to wipe out the Arrhenius equation. You could still use it to, I don't know, compute, you know, degradation of, of atomic uh, radiation in, in something or whatever. There's probably a million ways you could use the Arrhenius equation because it just sounded like some sort of algorithm or um, logarithmic reduction type of uh, equation. And, and they said, listen, they're just using it in an assembly line process to open up an injection, you know, a plastic injection molding thing. They're computing when the plastic is solid enough to open up the mold so it doesn't pour out. You can actually take the part out and, you know, turn it into a child's toy or something. And those are important as we're coming up to the following cases. We've got um, Bilski, where they just punted, so we won't talk about that, and Mayo versus Prometheus, okay? Let's talk about Mayo a little bit. We did it from tw uh, the Twin Cities office of Fish and Richardson. We nursed that sucker for you know eight years and got it up to the Supreme Court through fits, stops, and everything else. And you say, well, wait a minute. I, you know, I'm from so and so software company. What do I care about Mayo Clinic? You know, what does that have to do with me? Um, and the answer is, we had software people on our team. We had life sciences people on our team and software people on our team. And the strategy from day one in these appeals was to come up with some solution that would work in both areas because we didn't think we had a chance of winning if we didn't come up with that solution. That the court would not see it as important, that it would see it as this sui generis little thing for life sciences and that we'd never get cert review or anything else. Also, we had the cases in front of us, Fluke, Benson, and Deere, and we liked the way they laid out um, as compared to the Prometheus claims. And so we wanted to make our case look more like the software cases there. And so I've got a little um, sketch of what the claim is in Prometheus. It's basically give someone thiopurine and then test their blood and then see what the metabolites of thiopurine. So a metabolite is, you know, the chemical created in your blood when you metabolize something. See what's left there. And then, you know, if, if the metabolites are above 700, you're giving them too much of the drug. And if they're below 700 or 500, you're giving them not enough. And that's all the claim said. It didn't say, well, then increase the dosage by 10% if the, if the metabolite levels are 20% low or anything. There was no output to the claims. There was no limitation in how this knowledge of the physician was used. And that, and we said, boy, that kind of looks like Fluke and Benson. No output. You're just doing this processing 
and you got, yeah, you're okay, you got to give the person a drug and take their blood, but that's just part and parcel of doing the processing. That's just part and parcel of recognizing this natural correlation between the metabolites and the patient's health. They're getting too much drug or too little. And you're, therefore, you're trying to stop people, essentially, from using this natural correlation in any way whatsoever, okay? Now, a lot of people look at the claim and say, well, it's a lot narrower than what you wrote down here, Drake, Seth, and, the, and it's true, it was narrower. But Prometheus sought a very broad construction in that case and basically wiped out their ability to argue that the claim was narrower because of that, because of what they did at the district court. So the claim ended up being about as broad as the one I, uh, uh, as the shorthand I show here. Um, but the key thing is, you know, we treated it and we thought about it much like software claims. You got some inputs, you do some processing, and then you're done. Okay. Also, if you're from New York, I'm going to switch slides here, so you better write down that your New York CLE code is 917. Your state does not trust you. The rest of the country, our state boards of, of CLE trust us. So I don't know what some New Yorker did years ago, but whenever you have something like that, somebody must have done a real doozy um, to be the only state that requires a number. So write that number down and you get your CLE. All right. Now, to today, Alice versus CLS Bank. I've got a shorthand of the claim. <clears throat> it basically is creating uh, debit records and, and uh, adjusting um, you know, what different people owe each other and clearing it out at the end of the day. Okay? The Supreme Court said it's, it's an abstract idea of exchanging financial obligations between two parties using a third-party inter intermediary to mitigate the settlement risk. Oh, yeah, so you had a third party that held on to the money. And then when they cleared at the end of the day, they decided who should get the money, and, and all was good, right? The claim looked like Bilski. Bilski had to do with, what, hedging, uh, using weather data or something like that. It just it looks so much like Bilski. But, the, you know, the bottom line is that the, the court said, you know, you got a lot of nice words in here, but this is nothing more than that abstract idea, okay? You know, yeah, you talk about computer, but it's it bolted on. It really doesn't do anything. You need to have something more. And then the court, you know, consistent with what our strategy had been in Mayo is to make the Mayo case, you know, a what we called a grand unifying theory. The court here relied on Mayo, not on Bilski, not on anything else. The court went right to Mayo for this software case. They went to a life sciences case. And they said, listen, there's a two-step test from Mayo. That's at the bottom of the slide. Step number one, are the claims directed to a patent ineligible concept? We used to call that no-nos on our team. Um, you know, a law of nature, natural correlation, uh, uh, an algorithm, an abstract idea, et cetera. So somewhere in there are the claims aimed at one of those things or not. Doesn't mean that it has to recite, you know, the Arrhenius equation or, or do it explicitly, but in the claim somewhere, is there one of those no-nos? And then if there is, you got to say, okay, well, what else does the claim have so that you're not effectively preempting every use of that no-no, right? And that's your two-step process, and that's what, what everybody's doing now is kind of doing this Mayo two-step. Um, and, you, you know, you should look to make sure it's not more than just some drafting effort designed to monopolize the abstract idea. <clears throat> what I provide the, the test is a lot of people say, well, so the test is are you trying to patent an abstract idea? I don't like that. That's vague to me. The test is, do you, you know, do you claim an abstract idea? Well, that makes no sense either because Deere claimed, at least recited in its claim, the Arrhenius equation, right? So he claimed the Arrhenius equation. I don't like that either. So what I say on, on the test is, are you trying to preempt effectively all uses of the abstract idea? That's what you should ask. Um, let me just, uh, we're low on time. Actually, we're out, but I'll, about a minute or two to finish up here. Um, the government standard, which you should know because it's important, the government proposed this idea that software would be patent eligible, and this is not the patent office government, this is you know, Obama administration, and I know he runs the patent office, but you guys all know that they don't always agree. The, the, the solicitor's standard was that software is patent, patent eligible only where it improves the function of the computer itself. So um, the example that everybody threw around was encryption, stuff like that, right? Maybe graphics processing might be, you know, things like that, making computers better. Um, or two, it affects an improvement in any other technology or technical field. I think that's a nod to the Deere case, right, where the software improved 
an, uh, an assembly line operation with injection molding. Um, and so, you know, under that, you could see computers used to do uh, chemical mixing and things like that should be patentable under those standards. Um, the problem with the government standard was they could not, at oral argument, and, and the, the party that was on their side, really couldn't explain how you would possibly get a business method patent under their standard. They said, well, you know, you could have a business method that involves encryption, and the court's like, well, then that's an encryption patent. <coughs> um, but they just could not explain for the court why their standard would allow any decent business method patent. And I think the majority of the court said, we got to allow some sort of business method patenting because we have several efforts by Congress that mention business method patents. And so you see here there was a concurrence. These three judges didn't care about the, what I just said. They just kill everything. They don't like business method patents. The majority of the court would like to kill a lot of stuff, but they were hung up on the idea that you should have business method patents. So what they ended up doing was saying, well, the government standard are two good examples of when you can get a patent, okay, but we're going to apply the Mayo standard and ask, you know, whether you're doing more than just bolting on a generic computer or saying apply it, all right? So there you see the part one of the test and part two of the test um, applied in, in the software area of the Mayo test. Um, okay, so let's take a look. I think I have post. Oh. How to survive. I've got this list. I said I have no great answer for you, so I have a list. Express your abstract idea at different levels. Well, let me give you number one that's not on the list. Pretend you're European, right? Try to pass the European test for patent eligibility, um, and if you can do that, you're safe, right? So two things there. Ask yourself right at the beginning, will this invention pass the European test? And if the answer is yes, then plow right forward, send it to your outside counsel, have them draft a spec, okay? If the answer is no, then you move to a different analysis of do I really want to file a patent on this, right? So that's probably the first test you should be asking yourself when you get an invention disclosure. But when you, once you have drafted or if you have something in prosecution already, you should be asking yourself, boy, can I write this claim in a way that would survive in Germany? Because if I can, maybe I should do that. You know, if it won't kill me on scope, I should be trying to do that. So that's probably the, the, the most important thing. And of course, I didn't put it on the list. Goes, goes to show you. Um, but some others here, uh, you know, I won't read through all of them. Uh, I think it's, you know, realize that you can express any level of abstraction for a software claim. So then what you have to do is start expressing some of those and saying them out loud and say, does that sound legitimate? And am I really kind of preempting all uses of that? Or am I merely bolting a generic computer onto that abstract idea? Um, you know, somewhat, if, the abs if you can state your abstract idea in four words, um, that's pretty abstract. If it takes more words than that, you know, more than 10 words to state the idea, then there's a better chance that it's not an abstract idea. I know, a little uh, rules of thumb that usually don't work, but they're nice to have. I also, I like my BA versus BS uh, test. If you, could if you could be an inventor of your invention and have an MBA or a, you know, a BA, Bachelor of Arts degree, then the invention's probably in trouble, right? Um, that's a, a, a neat little uh, rule of thumb. Um, don't claim results and functions. You're going to see some stuff coming up here, and Mark Lemley's been preaching on this, is that way too many software claims just claim the result or the function, but not how to get there, not the technical steps to get there. You know, they're trying to nail these under 112 and other areas, but I think they're also getting nailed now under 101. You know, the courts are just saying, listen, you're just, you're just stating these functions. It's, there's, there's really nothing technical here. You're claiming what you want the computer to do, but not how you want the computer to do it. It's hard to tell the difference between, you know, result and function on one hand and how, how to get there on the other. But, you know, try to do that if you can. Um, as always, use deep dependent claims because you can hedge your bets. Maybe your independent claim is invalid, but one of your dependent claims lives. That, that solves all sorts of problems for you, right? 112 problems, 103 problems. Good dependent claims can save your life in many ways. Um, don't use uh, vague words. I've got other points here. Um, I'll just leave those be. You can read them. And then the next few slides, I just went through, and there was a, a piece on Vox, uh, a website that cataloged all the decisions since, um, since Alice that have killed, they've all killed the patents, every one of them. And I figured you guys would like to have this. I'm not going to go through any of them. Um, I try to put enough data in here so you can just kind of read through and get a sense. 
That way, if you've got a case that's similar, you'll be able to jump to it. Here's three at the Federal Circuit. Somehow Judge Hughes has an in on the uh, scheduling, the, the supposedly random assignment process, right? Even though he's the rookie, he's getting assigned all the good 101 cases. Don't ask me what's happening. Um, so that's that slide. And then we get to the district courts. Here are some of their decisions. And then if, if you are a patentee, you would call uh, September 3rd bloody, oh, these, we're not on September 3rd here. Let's go to the next slide. Bloody whatever day of the week that was. Let's call it Bloody Wednesday. Um, Oh, that they've been split up into different slides enough that you don't see, but there are like three or four or something decisions on September 3rd at the district court level killing patents. Um, I'm probably going to take this and turn it into a table so that you can get a sense for, for, for example, whether it was done under Rule 12 or done under summary judgment and, and readily see that so that if you have cases, uh, you can say, okay, I want to see all the cases that, that did under Rule 12 because the you know, my opponent is complaining that it's too early in the process. I think I also need to figure out whether there was a claim construction involved or not, because that's important for people being able to establish that a patent can be invalidated under 101 um, without a claim construction. But hopefully this is helpful to you. I, I know I saw a question on the side about can we get copies of these. I hope uh, that, you know, our, our marketing folks can get you copies. If not, um, I, I can send them to you. I, I told you my last name, Drakeseth at fr.com. Um, just send me a note, and I can send the slides back to you as a PDF. Um, please don't, you know, I don't know. If you want to use it, give me some attribution. Um, you, use your own ethics. I think you guys are all ethical enough. Um, I'm trying to look now. People are asking, a lot of you New Yorkers want your CLE codes, so uh, I've addressed that. Um, Here's a question. It says, could this be used by a plaintiff where the defendant puts up a senseless prior art defense or floods you with prior art references with little development of the case? Oh, gosh, darn it. I can't remember when that question was asked, so I'm trying to think um, which issue that was. I guess, oh, it's, it would be the, um, it would be the uh, octane fitness uh, uh, cases. So can it, could a uh, patentee move for fees if a plaintiff just floods you with prior art and little development of the case? I think so. I mean, obviously, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, you know, there's kind of historically the fees awarded against the defendant have been limited to uh, willfulness and then litigation misconduct. Um, you, you, you know, I guess that let me put a, a finer point on the question. Could you somehow use Octane to get fees in that situation, even if the judge didn't feel like there was litigation misconduct per se, but this was still an out of the ordinary case, right? You know, they were within the within the ring of battle, but they weren't really doing a very good job within the ring of battle. Um, and I think, yeah, you, you could definitely use that that test uh, to to get fees as a patentee in that situation. So, you know, I think that's a good question, right? So you're not necessarily limited to willfulness and you know, kind of unethical behavior for getting fees as a patentee. You could potentially get uh, fees as a patentee for, you know, defendant having a really cruddy case, so to speak, uh, uh, situation. Um, I think that's all I have in front of me for questions. If somebody wants to type some quickly, that's fine. Um, just a reminder, October 15th, they're going to be talking about trade secrets. I uh, thank you all for coming. I gave you my, my email, but I'll do it again, dragseth at fr.com. I'll take uh, any questions you might have. Um, you can even ask me about the Minnesota Vikings and the Adrian Peterson situation. I'll give you my opinion on that. Um, but otherwise, I thank you for coming. I hope it was helpful. And if I didn't answer anything or you have any uh, follow-up you need, please feel free to contact me. Thank you very much. This concludes today's conference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation.